Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurachek. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Kelly Roman of Fisher Wallace Laboratories, and they have a cranial electro therapy stimulation device, which is TCAS, alternating current stimulator. And they're using this to treat insomnia, anxiety, and uh, depression as well. Uh, kind of a simple headband that you put on your head and an electric, small electric current goes through, kind of calms the body. So interesting stuff. Yeah. Kelly Roman, pleasure to have you on the show. You are at Fisher Wallace, which basically does TDCS. We do the alternating kind, which is a little bit unusual. So there's quite a few TDCS labs and and so forth, but we're actually doing alternating current in terms of the user experience is pretty similar. Yeah, and it's pretty cool stuff. I mean, you guys uh, put on kind of the, like this headband thing and uh, with the power of like a nine volt battery to stimulate the brain, zap the brain in order to kind of work with anxiety disorders, insomnia, depression. And uh, yeah, sounds kind of too good to be true. How does this work? <laughs> so we actually acquired the technology from the inventors around 2007 and the device at that point had been cleared by the FDA as a grandfathered 510K medical device and had a couple of published biomarker studies that the inventors had funded and, and gotten published in peer-reviewed journals. So what we then did at that point is invest in some more research around efficacy and, uh, and safety. We funded a, a study in 2009 at Phoenix House which is a big drug and alcohol rehab center. And they use the device to treat patients who had just stopped using heroin, cocaine, alcohol, three different groups of patients, and were in a residential treatment center. So they were living at the clinic. And so they tracked mood, uh, sleep, as well as uh, retention rate. So retention means these aren't prisoners, so they, they can leave the facility whenever they want. But there is a pretty high dropout rate with rehab. That's a problem because there's a correlation that's been proven that people who stay in rehab have a lower recidivism rate. That was really the problem they're trying to solve is can we keep these people in rehab? And so they compared standard of care at the rehab facility for 180 days plus versus standard of care plus our device. And the patients that had both our device and standard care stayed in rehab at a rate 50% higher at 90 days and 180 days. So that was the first indication we had like clinical application in a study where we're like, wow, we really have something here. It's important. And then we funded a study at Mount Sinai on bipolar two depression. That was a randomized double blind placebo controlled study. So very high quality study design. And that was the first study we did where we're actually looking at the difference between placebo device and active device. So the study we did at Phoenix House did not have a placebo. It was just their standard of care versus standard of care plus our device, our active device. And in the Mount Sinai study, we compared a uh, placebo device, and which is basically a device that looks like it's working but actually doesn't have the output coming out for more than two seconds versus our device, which has a 20-minute treatment brain simulation session. And the effect size or the difference between placebo and active was very big once you got into week two. So in week one, there was a placebo effect and it, it tracked fairly closely to active. And by the end of week two, placebo patients had gone back to baseline, which means they've got, they went back to where they started. And the active patients stayed treated and stayed with a low or no symptoms. So we've been able to market the device because we had that 510K clearance. And now we've sold 60,000 devices roughly over the last 10 years. I've also been able to capture some data from patients and providers and we are now in the process uh, of finishing up a sleep-related study at Baylor with 42 subjects, Baylor, Scott & White Health in Texas. And we're launching two studies this summer, uh, one for insomnia and one for generalized anxiety disorder. And each of those will have roughly 50 subjects. And the FDA, meanwhile, has given us now a full approval path. We've been FDA cleared, which is what you get with the 510K. 
And then the FDA has said to us, here's what you have to do to get fully approved, which is why we're doing these extra studies. And once we submit that data, then we get FDA approval. So we're expecting FDA approval. It could come as early as next summer and maybe the fall of 2021. It's, it's a little bit different than TDCS. So TDCS, direct current, has fixed polarity. So the electrodes, anode, cathode are fixed with alternating polarity is switching in the electrodes. So 66 milliseconds, we're switching the polarity. And we have a package of frequencies that user wears it for 20 minutes. We place the electrodes roughly above the sideburns. We're targeting more of the Broadman areas of the brain, which have connectivity to dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We've done some FNIRs work, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activity immediately from increase in activity from, from the stimulation, even though we're not placing the electrodes over the forehead, like you would see with a lot of TDCS and TMS type devices. So, you know, the biomarker studies we've done show increases in serotonin, endorphins, lowering of cortisol, stress hormone, and blood, saliva, cerebral spinal cord fluid testing. One of our competitors, AlphaStim, did a study that showed modulation of default mode network. That's possible for us. And the third mechanism would be brainwave entrainment. So uh, that's something that TDCS does not do. It will, will not entrain brainwaves, at least have, hasn't been shown to, whereas alternating current does. So that means you can get a person into an alpha brainwave state, and that state has duration even after you stop the stimulation. You can, you're entraining the, the brain to be in that state. And so between that and the neurochemical production, neurochemical effect, that is very likely why we're seeing such improvements in anxiety and sleep. The depression as well, although I think the depression in some ways is more complex to treat. We have, again, 60,000 patients. We have doctors who have prescribed this hundreds of times and who have reported publicly a 70, 75% success rate with their patients, which is very high and, and with almost no side effects. So it's a 1% side effect rate, roughly. We have a headache, dizziness. You compare that to antidepressant medication, SSRIs have a 38% side effect rate. So that's an established large study. So we have the advantages of almost no side effects. We sell the device, retails for 800, but we do a lot of discounting. We're doing a, a $300 discount right now because of COVID, because so many people have lost their jobs and there's a lot of economic uncertainty. So Right now, you can you can get a device on FisherWallace.com for five hundred dollars, and we have a thirty day return policy, free return shipping. So we we basically make that we make it very easy and free for the for the customer to send it back for the patient to send it back. We're not asking patients where the device doesn't work. Say that let's say twenty percent if it doesn't work for them at all. I think the the percentage actually looks to be less than that. It looks to be around more, more like fifteen because. The doctors tend to be treating more certain specific kind of groups of patients. But when you look at all of our patients, a lot of them have comorbidities. So they, they have two or three of the symptoms that they're trying to treat. So our patients are reporting to us a higher than 70, 75. We're, they're reporting more 80 to 85% uh, success rate with at least one symptom. So that's very encouraging and very validating in combination. So that's anecdotal data from the patients. But combination from what we're getting from the clinical trial data, it's pretty encouraging. I believe that this is going to, this will grow into something that's way more mainstream than it is today. I'm a big fan of BCI technology, closed loop technology, and, and there's a lot of, we can talk about that. I know a lot of your listeners are very much into the brain computer interface and things more like Neuralink and, and embedded. We kind of look at ourselves compared to that, and certainly compared to something that's embedded as we're going to be the non-invasive, easy to use, easy to self-administer, inexpensive part of the ecosystem. But we're not going to be the, the surgically implanted. We may be closed loop at some point, but I think we can talk about this, but I think one of our advantages is, is, is our simplicity and the cost savings and the effectiveness with a closed loop system that's going to be more sophisticated, more expensive. Yeah, obviously, you need sensors, but still doable. But I think we, we happen to have a very effective fixed output device and one that is soon to be FDA approved. We have clinical data on it. We've got tons of patients on it. And there's going to be more 
more sophisticated embeddable solutions that I think for things like treating, you know, blindness or treating memory and, and so forth are going to do a way better job than we'd be able to do. I think for for treating mood and sleep, it's it's going to be hard to beat a the cost and ease of use and effectiveness and safety of what we're doing, even even though there is, of course, more sophisticated technology out there. Yeah, really. I mean, it it is an interesting, like both an implantable and invasive and non-invasive both have advantages and disadvantages. And this is really cool. I mean, this reminds me of vagus nerve stimulation. And I'm wondering if anything behind that, is this similar to that? This kind of reminds me of a non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. We're not targeting the vagus nerve. I mean, I think our competitor, AlphaStim, is more of a vagus nerve stimulation. They have ear clip electrodes. And obviously, VNS devices that are tar- that, that you apply to the neck. If you want to put it in a bigger basket, you could kind of think of it in the same general family as that because that is a non-invasive. I haven't seen data to show that the, the vagus nerve is more effective or even near as effective in treating anxiety or sleep issues as we are. We have to do a little bit more work in... Yeah, I want to get some fMRI data and some better brain imagery data on our device. We're now we've been profitable for a little while now, and and uh, and we've raised some money, so we finally have access to capital to kind of do some of these things that I've wanted to do for a while. The, the, we have a little bit. We did a little bit of fMRI data that wasn't published that shows that our stimulation is reaching the center brain, basal ganglia. So I think that that's a very different approach than than vagus nerve stimulation, obviously. Our electrodes are placed under or placed over one of the thinnest areas of the skull. I think there could be in the future other devices out there that are taking the same approach, but we use a very high carrier frequency of 15,000 hertz. A lot of all the other CES devices and TDCS devices are, are using much lower hertz uh, frequencies. So they're you know, using a high powered magnet. It's doctor administered. I think they're working on some more portable versions of it. They're targeting mostly dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So yeah, there, there's a nice family of devices there. I think from my experience doing this for 10 years, there's kind of a big difference between academic and and the business side of, of this. The academic is a lot more robust and there's a lot more scientists and researchers and clinicians slash researchers that are working in this field than there are actually commercially viable products and businesses in this field. There have been a number of products, but but the businesses go bankrupt. It's very different trying to run a business in this field than it is doing research. And I think I'm more of a business guy. We work with researchers. My brother is a researcher. I grew up reading journal articles in Nature and so forth, but because of him, I'm more focused on business and marketing and regulatory and and all that. I have the pleasure of working with some brilliant scientists and, and MD, PhDs and so forth on the research side, but I think there can be kind of a a seduction around technology in in an academic setting that that it's a way different, much different challenge to actually commercialize and to market, especially if you don't have insurance coverage right off the bat, people have to pay money out of their own pocket. TMS is probably one of the better success stories in terms of commercialization, but I think they're having trouble. I mean, yes, they have doctor administration, but all doctor administration is expensive. Their devices are expensive. But they don't appear to be more effective than what we're doing. Why not have a device that, say, in a couple of years only costs 300 bucks? If you can treat depression and insomnia for 300 bucks, I mean, that's cheaper than anything else out there. It's cheaper than drugs over the course of a year. It's cheaper than talk therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. It's cheaper than any of these other stimulation technologies. So I I think that's that's where I try to live more is like, where where is this going to be as a business and how do you keep it sustainable and grow and ubiquitous, but you still have to have the science and and you have to show efficacy and, and I think I think the safety question has been put to bed. I mean, we've been on we've sold sixty thousand devices. I think there's eight adverse event reports at FDA out of sixty thousand, right? So I don't think anyone questions the safety of this anymore. At least in terms of our device, I, I realize there's a, a very cool DIY TDCS community out there, and you know, I have no problem with that. I wouldn't want to put that on my head if there wasn't scientific data and so forth. And I don't. I think most people would not, but mass mass consumers and patients and so forth, and providers. So, 
I think as this field moves forward, we have to make sure that we're science first, but also how do you build a sustainable business, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you brought up a lot of interesting points there. And and yeah, I think this is an interesting way to do it. I mean, there is a big DIY community for this. And I think it's cool. And, and for a lot of students who are penny pinchers, they're, they're like, okay, well, let me just put this together. But there could be adverse events with that. That being said, I mean, this is kind of a band that you wear on your head. Have you guys seen a difference? Like if there's a bad placement of the band, does it ever like have the opposite effect where you get more anxious, you sleep worse or something like this? Like, or if you put it on backwards, there is there like an opposite effect or what ways could a patient mess this up, I guess? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So first of all, the before you even get to the band itself, just the output of the device kind of limits the ability to, to hurt yourself. So we have a four milliamp maximum output. There's a lot of TDCS devices that go a lot higher than that. I mean, I've seen commercialized devices that go to 10 milliamps and so forth, um, 16 milliamps. We, we max out at four, right? We actually use two AA batteries, by the way. Not, not, our competitor does use a nine volt, uh, which is probably why you saw a nine volt. If you're ever a kid and you put two, two AA batteries on your tongue, you're, you're fine. But anyway, we, so it's very low amperage, but not too low that it doesn't have a clinical effect, but we're starting at a safe place there. And then in terms of electro placement, you don't want to put the electrodes on your eyes. I wouldn't put them on your eyes. I wouldn't put them on, on top of your eyes. I, I, I mean, I, I think, but, and I don't know if there's any real risk to that, but that's one of the things that we just make sure people know. One of the contraindications is don't use the device if you have a pacemaker. Now, why is that? It's because stimulation output devices will have a resonance that, will, that can interfere with implanted electronic devices. So if you have, a, for instance, a deep brain stimulator implanted in your head, you should not use our device. If you have an electronic stent in your head, you should not use our device. If you have shrapnel in your head, you can probably use it fine, but you're not going to want the shrapnel underneath the electrode site, right? If you happen to have metal fillings, it's okay. It's, there's no problem there at all. But you should not have an implanted electrical device. That, that's really where the risk is. Where the electrode placements are, if we have doctors that actually put the electrodes on the forehead or at the back, back of the head. These are doctors who have a lot of experience in applying different kinds of stimulation montages, and, and we, you, they're free to do that. But we tell patients and doctors who, who don't have tons of experience with brain stimulation, we put our electrodes in the same place every time, you just slide them up above the sideburn. You want the bottom of the electrode to be basically in line with the top of the ear. And that placement, one on each side, doesn't change the, regardless of what you're treating with, with our device. There's no risk of moving the electrodes around. But decades ago, when these devices were kind of being you know, invented and distributed in like the 50s and 60s, there were people who were putting them on their eyes. Outside of that, there's no risk. I think you, you could see... Some of these doctors who are putting electrodes on the forehead, for instance, with ADHD patients, there's there's one doctor who does that because he's found success treating uh, pediatric ADHD with that particular placement of electrodes. It's not one that we market. We don't market the pediatrics at all. Okay. And then you actually bought this company from the original inventors. I haven't heard about this being done too often. I mean, especially unless it's like with a big company like Medtronic or something like this. What was that like? And what are kind of the advantages and disadvantages of doing something like this? That's a good question. So, uh, I mean, I think each of these opportunities is unique, right? There's not really going to be a, a model. The way that this particular deal happened, so the company is called Fisher Wallace. So my partner is Chip Fisher. There was someone named Martin Wallace who passed away and I, I replaced Wallace. Wallace died a year into this project, unfortunately, of cancer. But he was an addiction. He worked to get a lot of addiction patients. And he was using the device that used to be called the LISS stimulator, L-I-S-S. When the LISS brothers uh, were the engineers, they had gotten him a device. He had used it in his practice and he found that it had been effective. Now, this would have been in the early 2000s. So when Martin Wallace met Chip at a conference that's when he asked Chip, hey, these guys are in their 80s. I think we should try and acquire the intellectual property and, and market this ourselves. And so uh, that's what they ended up doing. They basically bought, I mean, it was, I guess they could say they bought the company, but really what they were buying at the time was the patents 
and the manufacturing. So we, they, they were able to not just get the intellectual property, but they had a factory that was already making these. So that was, that was very helpful. So they didn't have a lot of patients, they didn't have a lot of prescribers. And I think to put it in the larger context, the List brothers, while being brilliant engineers, they invented this device in the 90s, originally looked a little bit different. But that was when drug therapy was in its heyday, right? I mean, you had Prozac in, I think it was 86, 87. You had Lexapro in 1990. And those are drugs that had, when they came to market, probably anywhere from 12, you know, 12 to 14 years left on their patent or something. And so I don't have to tell you, I mean, just the amount of marketing money and sales forces that were deployed, it totally changed America. All of a sudden, everyone was taking Ambien, Wellbutrin. And that was also before internet advertising, pretty much. In the 90s and early 2000s, it was not easy to advertise other than to compete with pharma, other than if you had a ma- if somehow, maybe if you were a billionaire, you could have financed massive TV advertising. But the List Brothers, they had a great product, but they didn't have the, the capital um, or the knowledge really to market it effectively. And this is a bad time to market it because you're competing against pharma that was eating up all the airwaves and all of people's attention and all the doctors were being called upon by these sales reps. So when we got involved, it was right when all these drugs were coming out of patent. And, you know, you don't see ads anymore for antidepressants and sleeping pills. I mean, very rarely. We came into this when the drug companies were like no longer gung-ho on, on these kinds of drugs in terms of branded drugs. Now it's all generic. And the internet was there, right? So I started using Facebook and Google. I had experience. I actually come out of a media business. I actually worked for Nature, the journal publication. Then I also worked for a software company and I worked for Nielsen. So I, I had a lot of experience with digital marketing, even in 2009 when I, when I met up with my with partner after Wallace had passed away. I was focused on building a business with and bringing patient, educating patients on our website, driving traffic there with Google and Facebook. And then I, we've developed a pretty sophisticated email marketing program since then. Today, we, we drive 150, 200,000 people a month for a website. We'll sell $6 million worth of devices this year. Right? And, and that's nothing. Right? That's the tip of the iceberg. The next year, I hope to sell $15, $20 million worth of devices. You know, we've been growing pretty much organically. We have never taken outside money until last year. We raised a $1 million in equity crowdfunding. So that's allowed us to invest in some more clinical trials. That's kind of the genesis story. I don't think that's ever going to be right. No one's going to have that exact same story, but that's just how it happened. <laughs> that's how it happened for us. We we don't know how the story is going to end yet. We hope it's a happy ending, but we'll, we'll find out. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, everybody's on their own path, right? You can't make sweeping generalizations or anything like this, but I can make some recommendations. Kelly, is there that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? No, I think that covers it. I just say I don't want to overplug what we do, but if you want to learn more about us, fisherwallace.com, F-I-S-H-E-R, wallace.com. And, and you can find me on LinkedIn. I know a lot of people who listen to your podcast are in the science field, the business field in this area. would love to connect with you. So please don't be shy. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Say that you've heard this podcast, so I'll know some context and and we can pick up the conversation there. So I really appreciate being on this. It's not often that I get to speak directly to people who actually have an interest in this field. So I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.